Welcome, everyone. I'm glad to see that we have so many joining us today. Uh, the event we are presenting is called a Native Youth Roundtable, sharing stories of adverse childhood experiences caused by historical trauma and our path to resiliency. Uh, the National American Indian and Alaska Native Mental Health Addiction and Pre Prevention Technology Transfer Center, as well as the Trauma Treatment and Service Adaption, Adaption Center are all supported by grants from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. The content of this event is the creation of the presenters and the opinions expressed do not necessarily reflect the views or policies of SAMHSA, HHS, or the American Indian and Alaska Native MHTTC, ATTC, PTTC, and Trauma Treatment and Service Adaption Center. The event today is presented to you by the American Indian and Alaska Native Leadership Academy, the National American Indian and Alaska Native Trauma TSA Center, and the Tribal College and University Initiative. We are hosting a Native Youth Roundtable to kick off the SAMHSA National Child Tra Traumatic Stress Initiative Category 2 Trauma TSA Center. Native youth leaders will explore a youth perspective on historical trauma, the adverse childhood experiences it has caused, and the re resiliency it has inspired. The panelists come from different geographical areas and tribes, such as Absentee Shawnee, Sac and Fox, Kiowa, and Meskwaki. My name is Monica Dreyer Rossi. I'm the program manager for the American Indian and Alaska Native Leadership Academy and the Tribal College and University Initiative. And with that, I will hand it over to my colleague, Teresa Bruinton. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Teresa Bruinton. I work for the Native Student Behavioral Health at the University of Iowa. I am the co-director of the National American Indian and Alaska Native MHDC K-12 School Supplement and the co-director for the National American Indian and Alaska Native Child Traumatic Stress Initiative Category 2. Thank you. Oh, I will go ahead and pass it off to Jordan. Uh, my name is Jordan Brenching. I'm a graduate research assistant for the Native Center for Behavioral Health, working primarily with Monica and the Leadership Academy. I will be graduating in May with my master's in school counseling from the University of Iowa. And I'll be passing it off to Maya Davis. Hi, everyone. My name is Maya. Um, I'm also a graduate research assistant here at the Native Center for Behavioral Health. I am uh, finishing up my master's in public health this year, and I will pass it off to Liz. Hi, everyone. I'm Liz. I am a second year MPH at, in the Community and Behavioral Health Department and Monica's other GRA for the Native Center for Behavioral Health, and I work mostly with the Leadership Academy as well. And I'll pass it back to Teresa. Thank you, everyone. That is our team here at the Native Center for Behavioral Health. I do want to say a, a few things before we get started. Uh, today's event is a kickoff to introduce our new National American and Alaska Native National Trauma Treatment Service Adaption TSA Center. We are funded through SAMHSA. We will work to increase national infrastructure for Native and the non-Native workforce capacity to effectively prevent, reduce, and treat trauma and increase wellness and resiliency among American Indian and Alaska Native children, adolescents, and their families. Given respect uh, that Native Americans' traditional culture and spiritual value is gonna be at the forefront of everything that we do. Our approach is to provide prevention and intervention programs that mitigate trauma and promote resiliency. We will also be offering services and program implementation to service systems such as schools, juvenile justice, courts, child welfare programs, and healthcare settings. With this grant, we will launch several new initiatives, ongoing training support groups, on-call hours, a resource hub, products, fact sheets, pocket guides um, that will be disseminated throughout Indian country. I do want to define what trauma is. 
Uh, there is approximately one in four U.S. children that have been exposed to significant trauma events. Um, it is from ages one to 16. Trauma results from exposure to a single event or a series of events that are emotionally disturbing or life-threatening with lasting adverse effects causing mental, physical, social, and emotional and spiritual well-being. Examples of trauma related to our native youth is historical trauma, intergenerational trauma, racism, violence, bullying, natural disasters, catastrophic diseases such as COVID, um, exposures to tra traumatic events can, um, can come from poverty, suicide, abuse and neglect, substance abuse, domestic violence, separation from family and loved ones, natural disasters, and unintentional accidents. When children are exposed to one or several of these traumatic events, they may show signs of traumatic stress, leading to sadness, anger, and other emotional and physical symptoms. Our goal is to provide the Native and the non-Native workforce the tools they need so that every Native youth can succeed and have their own success story. <clears throat> Today, we are going to honor our Native youth by addressing the underlying causes of these struggles. For this reason, we want to use this time to hear from our Native youth and bring light to historical trauma and adverse childhood experiences. Before we begin, I wanna make sure that everybody knows a couple of these definitions. Historical trauma was defined best by Maria Braveheart. She defines historical trauma as the cumulative, multi-generational collective experience of emotional and psychological injury in communities and its descendants. When they grow up, become parents, these issues have yet to be addressed or ignored. We become vulnerable and we start repeating these patterns. This cycle is intergenerational trauma. Ad adverse childhood experiences, also known as ACEs, are factors such as poverty, unemployment, chronic stress, intergener intergenerational trauma. Um, all of these and others contribute to ACEs. Next page, please. Before we begin, we want to offer this opportunity to other Native youth from ages 17 to 24 if you are doing good things in your native communities, if you're excelling in school, in college, um, if you consider yourself a um, native youth and you want to lead others in the right direction, please reach out to myself and Monica. We would love to have you as part of this initiative. Next page, please, or I think we're done. So I think we are ready for today's event. So let's start with inviting our Native youth, and I'm going to allow them to introduce themselves. And I'm going to start with Keely Driscoll. Um, I want to thank the Native Center for Behavioral Health uh, for inviting me to be on this panel today. My name is Keely Driscoll. I'm in my final semester at the University of Iowa studying international studies um, and certificates in sustainability and native studies. I'm hoping to go on to law school. Um, so I'm applying right now, but uh, yeah, I work at the Native Center for Behavioral Health and um, with Great Plains Action Society. And I'm from the Muskwaki Nation with ties to the Winnebago tribe of Nebraska. Um, one of my lifelong goals is to always be continually improving my cross-cultural competence and um, to raise awareness about the importance of it. Thank you. Thank you, Keely. Uh, next, I will go to Grace Wasesek. Oh, my name is Grace Wasescook, and I am a junior here at Iowa State University. Um, I'm studying geology, and I would like to work in national parks and learn more about the earth. Um, I I'm very grateful for this opportunity as I have been trying to get back to my roots. So this is a good start for me. Thank you. Thank you, Grace. And next we'll introduce Hashona Morningstar. Rice University, get a good on get. Hi everyone, it's wonderful to see you all here and I'm looking forward to our discussion. I am a current uh, 
freshman at Rice University, and I'm just glad to see everyone logged on, and I'm looking forward to our discussion. Thank you. <clears throat> Stevie Johnson. Hello, everybody. My name is Stevie Johnson. I'm an enrolled member of the Absentee Shawnee Tribe, and uh, I'm Sack and Fox. Um, I'm currently a junior at Norman North High School, and I'm happy to see so many participants. Thank you. And Shoshana Johnson. Greetings, everybody. My name is Shoshana Johnson, and I'm a member of the Absentee Shawnee Tribe. And I'm also Sacred Fox on my mother's side. My Shawnee name is Magawasi and I'm from the Roundfoot clan. I graduated from the University of Central Oklahoma in communications and journalism, where I learned about prevention work in Indian country. I interned at the Southern Plains Tribal Health Board for a few years until I was hired on as a project coordinator. While I was there, I learned a lot about grants, specifically SAMHSA grants for underage drinking, prescription drug misuse, and suicide prevention. After working there for a couple of years, I decided I wanted to work for my own tribe. So now I work as a public relations specialist for the Absentee Shawnee Tribe um, for our health system. And so we are located in Norman and Shawnee, Oklahoma. And I'm really excited to talk about resiliency and our personal experiences and welcome everybody. Thank you. Thank you, panelist. So now we will start with our first question. Um, why do you think this grant is important to American Indian and Alaska Native youth and their communities? And I'm gonna call on Stevie Johnson. Hello. Um, <clears throat> so I think it's principal to our communities in that we bring awareness to the matter and work together to provide solutions for um, trauma. And I know that I'm very fortunate to have the resources that I do in my community, but that's not the case for everybody. Um, I hope this grant focuses on providing assets to Native communities that would benefit their overall well-being and for communities to heal. Thank you. And if you need me to repeat the question, just let me know. So I will go ahead and call on Shoshona Dotson. Hello, everybody. So I really hope this grant program figures out a way to identify gaps in services among their community, bridge some um, gaps there, uh, other organizations in the community that aren't partnering with each other. I hope to expect community champions to be a part of this initiative as well along the way and just building up a consortium of other partners and people to really hone in on this message that we need to help our youth because of all of the traumas that these communities go through. And so I know if you are passionate about this work, it'll take you a long way because community members, they can see that. They are so used to the comings and goings of grant programs. So I think if your heart is in the right place, I think other people will see that and wanna join you. I hope to see more trauma-informed care at the community level. I know that may look a little differently now during a pandemic, but before then, I have seen different trainings bring back Native families together that were in conflict through a GONA train, Gathering of Native Americans, which is more about learning about the history of your tribe and the collective traumas communities have. And so I think it'd be a really great opportunity if this grant could do some similar activities like that as well. Thank you so much, Shona. And now I will call on Keely Driscoll. I think that this grant is really important to um, 
American Indian and Alaska Native youth because we're in a pivotal point where we're starting to recognize these things in public health that have always been disallowed, things like trauma. And so I think it's an opportunity to change what public health looks like in our communities um, because there are longstanding legacies of um, disparities and inadequate services of, and funding when it comes to our communities. So really disallowing um, these disparities and these deficit statistics and uh, in its place, um, providing services that are more culturally adaptive and appropriate for our communities um, can really just be the first step in shifting away from that and creating a greater national awareness for the need for more funding and programs like this. Thank you, Keely. Grace Wasteska, would you like to ask oh, the question? I think that this grant is very important because it can educate Native American youth just exactly on what um, trauma is. And in that sense, they can then reach out for help. Um, maybe they didn't necessarily know that what they were dealing with was something they could ask for help. So in that sense, I think it's very good. And for non-Native communities, it can also provide information and resources to help them support Native youth as well. Very good. And Hashona Morningstar, host. Yeah, I think this grant is very important to Native people because it allows us to acknowledge what has happened and it creates a safe space and the possibility of creating more safe spaces that allows Native youth to come together and I guess be more connected and address traumas and overall just create a positive impact on our different but similar Native communities. Absolutely, great answers and I appreciate that very much. Um, now I will go ahead and hand it over to Monica, my coworker, to answer the next question. Thank you, Teresa. So our next question for the panelists uh, is, how does historical trauma impact Native peoples? And how does historical tra trauma impact Native communities as a whole? And I am going to ask, for Shona first. Historical trauma very much affects our Native communities. I believe it's something that is happening um, from the loss of people losing their connections to their land, their culture, and like feeling connected to each other because of things such as colonization in the residential boarding schools. Um, it is something that continues on for generations from like my great grandparents to my grandparents, my parents and to me. And overall, it just ends up being the sort of vicious cycle that it is up to like current generations to put a stop to. And it is no secret that um, Native communities struggle with like serious difficulties such as poverty, violence, um, some poor health services, um, addiction, and homeless, homelessness, among other things. So I think it is important to acknowledge the historical trauma that is overall the root and the cause of many of these problems. And it, addressing historical trauma will not only allow us to face it head on, but allow us to look at the patterns that historical trauma is causing and learn from it so that we can overall heal as people. Thank you, Hoshona. Uh, Keely, will you go next, please? So I think trauma takes a lot of different forms um, across all of our communities um, due to all of our unique histories. Um, and so, even though it takes such different forms and even though it is an issue that needs to be addressed, I also, you know, going back to that definition of trauma, wanna emphasize that this isn't just something that happens, you know, to our people. It is a very natural response um, to the historical occurrences that have yet to be recognized. And so acknowledging that generational trauma exists also requires acknowledging the histories and learning about the histories and um, you know, seeing Native communities and people for what they actually are and not for 
the stories um, outside of those communities trying to define them. And so um, I think that's like the first step in recognizing generational trauma and um, seeing it for what it is um, and seeing all the possibilities and ways to overcome them and all of the different um, treatments and programs um, that could lead to, you know, successful um, resilience in our communities. Thank you, Keely. Stevie, could you go next, please? Yeah. Um, so I know for me personally, I'm still trying to understand how generational trauma impacts me and everything. Um, I know a common reason why uh, it impacts so many Native communities is, you know, say there's a parent and they went through a lot of traumas in their lives and, you know, they never learned how to talk about their feelings or anything like that. And so those behaviors get passed down to the, the kid and they don't talk to their parents about what's going on. And so in turn, this can lead to uh, unhealthy ways of coping. Um, but however, the kid can learn healthy ways to cope and break the cycle. I believe that it's about breaking the cycle and I feel that it's important to acknowledge that there has been trauma and it's up to that person who understands that to make the change. And it takes acknowledgement and self, and self responsibility to break the cycle of being a victim. Thank you so much, Stevie. And now let's hear it from Grace. Um, going off what was previously said, I think it is very important to break the cycle. And I think that um, historical trauma can be very impactful because for me personally, um, with, when my family has dealt with issues within the Native community, there has not been shame of being in the Native community, but shame of having these problems. And oftentimes the problems just wouldn't be addressed. So I think learning that trauma can affect everyone is very good at accepting that you can have help to step forward. So I think that um, generational trauma can cause a sense of shame or burden, but opening up and addressing that can lead to healing. Thanks so much, Grace. And now we will go to Shoshana. So historical trauma, it has definitely shaped my life in ways I'm still learning about. Because as I get older, the more I look from within and try to understand things that have happened in my life. You know, I always go back to my family and all of the struggles that they went through just to get me to this point. And so when I think about historical trauma, I think about my family. Um, my family and other Native families I grew up around suffered a lot of loss, loss of culture, loss of spirituality, loss of land. I have uncles that went to boarding school and they still suffer from those experiences. I've seen how it's impacted their life and their relationships with their family. So there's still a lot of pain, a lot of healing that our relatives are still going through and sometimes they don't know how to ask for help. Um, I think a lot of these things had a negative impact on our lives and how much, how we see ourselves and how we see others, how we see other natives and native communities, even how we see other tribes. Um, my family grew up in environments where they were seen as less than and they had to survive through those times for years. So I think this fostered an environment for lateral oppression to happen because hurt people hurt people. So I think it's important to talk about resiliency and helping not just native youth, but to include the whole family system to bring back our culture and our traditions and being proud of who we are. Thank you so much, Shoshona. Very good answers. I appreciate all your, your input from all of you. And now I will go leave it to Teresa. I get so involved in this, sorry about that. Shoshana, that was very well said. Hurt people hurt people. 
absolutely. And I think that's one thing that we are, are going through in Native communities. Um, excellent answers, panelists, very proud of you. Um, so let's go on to the next question. Um, what kind of initiatives, topics, projects would you like to see us focus on with this grant? And I will start with Stevie. Um, so I would like to see initiatives working with school counselors. Um, so I'm in the diversity coalition at my school and one meeting we were talking about how we'd like to see more people of color in those counselor positions. Um, I think that it's not that a non-native counselor wouldn't understand anything about the kid, but I just think that if there's a minority counselor for a no minority student, it would help uh, the student feel more comfortable telling them about what's going on and um, can help connect us on a different level. Thank you so much, Stevie. Um, and the next person I will call on is uh, Grace. Um, I think I also agree. I think that having representation in schools um, and having trauma curriculum in schools is very important. So I grew up in a predominantly white school. I did not go to a native school. And therefore, I think that it was difficult for me to be able to feel like I could open up on certain issues. So I think that if there was more trauma-informed curriculum in lots of different types of schools, it would be more beneficial for the children to reach out. Um, so that and just having a warm environment for children to be able to embrace their differences. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Grace, <laughs> did I call on you already? Yeah. I'm so sorry. I'm sitting here trying to look at the chat, listening to you guys, getting involved and getting confused. Um, Hashona. I think it's very important to allow Native youth to know that they have resources available to them. Because I knew, like, growing up in where I did, uh, I was very fortunate to have to know that all of these different resources were like there for me if I needed them. But I think it is important to have safe spaces for native youth to like feel connected to their culture and also help them, help them in life. Like maybe a higher education, they, they want help on finding programs that suit them to find a major, to find a a uh, higher education institution, I think that's very important. But also, it is also important to um, teach about historical trauma in schools and not just what uh, the history books are teaching now, which is that almost that Native Americans are kind of extinct and are just a part of history, if that makes sense. If there is like a curriculum that we can have that would allow that um that would allow native american youth and not just native american youth but like the whole population to learn about the different histories that uh, the united states has for native american populations i think that would also help and i think it would be very important and vital in order to move on Thank you so much for that. And next I will call on Keely. I very much agree with everything that was said. I think it's very important to, you know, reach out to the youth and see what they need in their individual communities and also address, you know, current issues such as COVID um, being a very precedent or a pressing issue and leading to com compounding effects um, that could lead to, you know, uh, diverse childhood experiences, like facing more disconnect, you know, in these younger years, maybe because of a um, 
inadequate access to internet, um, you know, transitioning into different school systems, such as higher ed education, like was already mentioned, and dealing with that extra cultural stress, um, attending predominantly white institutions and um, really needing to um, connect with a community, um, things like that, that I think um, really would support um, Native youth as they are trying to navigate these um, really unsure times. Thank you, Keely. And I think the only one I did not call on was Shoshana, correct? Correct. Um, so when I was growing up, I was a really shy kid. I was very quiet. I don't even know how I ended up in communications, let alone public relations, considering how painfully quiet and shy I've been my whole life. However, I come from a community where it was a predominantly white school. And in high school, I was struggling a lot at home. I was having a lot of emotional breakdowns at school and my friends would be there to comfort me. But it's like all the teachers, they didn't see me. I felt so invisible and just as if I was just crying for help but nobody was there to listen or nobody understood. And luckily things got better and I was able to speak up for myself more and got out of some situations that uh, just wasn't good for me. And I was able to be resilient and move on and continue with my education. So once I got to a point in my life when I was able to reflect on that experience, it really upset me because it just made me wonder how many other Native students felt that way. I know a lot of Native youth tend to be more on the shyer side. And I think that's just because of our culture. And, you know, for me, I wasn't really in, in our culture. You just don't really look at people in the eye or you just kind of respect the older people in the room. But for other cultures, it could look a little different. And so, once I became an adult and I learned about prevention and I learned about culture as prevention and all of these native organizations throughout the country that are trying to help um, the education system learn more about our trauma. And a few years ago, I went to a high school where there was a big native youth population, but a lot of the administrators, a lot of the teachers, were non-native. And so the, they brought in the National Council of Urban Indian Health. Oh, sorry, wrong, wrong organization. The National Indian Education Association because they have a training. It's called the Healing Blanket Exercise. And it's um, Indigenous Empowerment and Resilience Training, which is a history lesson developed in collaboration with Indigenous elders knowledge keepers and educators. So I was really interested to see how the non-native teachers and administrators, administrators would take to this training. And I saw a lot of good come out of it. I saw a lot of connections being made and a few teachers broke down because they just had no idea what kind of traumas their native students potentially were going through. And it really helped them understand that. And so I can only hope that similar trainings like that could be done through this grant program as well because I for because I saw the benefits of it firsthand. And it was really powerful for me and almost healing for me too to see that happen. You know, the teachers that I had back in the day, maybe maybe along the way they did get it at one point, but at least now I'm happy to see current teachers interested in this to connect more with their native youth. Thank you so much, Shoshona. Um, I just wanna add so many other Native American youth um, about what you said with school followed suit. I could say for myself, school was not a good place for me either. I did not have a voice. I would not look at you in the eye. Um, so I appreciate that personal perspective. 
Uh, with that, I will hand it over to Monica. Thank you all. So uh, our next question is, what are adverse childhood experiences? And what are some examples of how adverse childhood experiences can impact children within the Native communities? And I will go to Stevie first. So yeah, ACES stands for Adverse Childhood Experiences. Um, unfortunately, this is something common in Native communities and can be caused by emotional, sexual, physical abuse, um, a problematic drinker or drug user in the home, um, poverty, et cetera. And all these factors impact the youth in a negative way. Um, so some, some youth living in these conditions, um, you know, they may not be more, they may not be likely to do well in school. Uh, for example, um, they might have to work at night just to help support their family. And in turn, whenever they go back to school the next day, if they even do go to school the next day, you know, they'll be tired and, um, Having these childhood experiences, it can be hard to find a healthy way to get through it. And I know fortunately for me, um, I've had my experiences and I'm glad that I got to find programs and I guess you could call them like incentives to get through it. Thanks so much, Stevie. Okay, and we will call on Grace next. Um, I think that children all deal with um, certain trauma factors in certain ways. And um, ACES does affect a lot of children in Native communities. Um, a lot of children will, you know, speak out, become violent, become disruptive at school, and that can cause teachers to maybe give up on them or not give them the support that they need. Um, for me personally, coming from a broken home, I had one good home and one not good home. And because of that, I um, became very silent and very um, withdrawn at school, but teachers didn't recognize that as trauma and, you know, applauded me for being well behaved. But in reality, I was having a trauma experience that I didn't know how to address. So I think a lot of times um, these things can have children have create negative coping mechanisms. Thank you for sharing that, Grace. Um, and now we are going to go to Shoshana again. Okay. Wow, Grace, you know, everything that you just said, it really reminded me of a process that I went through as far as forgiving myself. Um, like I mentioned before, when I was younger, I, I went through a lot of issues as well. And at the time I acted out a lot, whether the adults knew about it or not, because I was just in so much pain. I, I just wanted to feel something. And I knew the things that I was doing was wrong. But when you're, when you don't even have hope anymore, you just, you don't care. And after overcoming that, and finding treatment of my own for my mental health. That's what I learned about ACEs. And it, learning about it really helped me identify situations in my life where, you know, I didn't know any better. I was a kid and I didn't know who to ask for help. And I went through a lot of forgiveness. And now I can see that, you know, ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, my family went through it, my parents went through it, it affected the way that they raised me and my relationships with them. And so learning about ACEs has helped me as far as understanding more about myself and the choices I've made and the choices that my family have made and just trying to be more forgiving and understanding that you don't know what you don't know until somebody introduces it to you. And so I'm really grateful that my mom saw a need for me 
to at least be exposed to prevention work because I think she was definitely worried about me and it helped me in a lot of ways understand ACEs and kind of see it more in my community and it would help me understand how to connect with people more too. Thank you for, for those reflections, Shoshana. And now we're going to go to Hoshana. So adverse childhood experiences, um, what I've learned said is very true. There are, the sad reality is that it's very frequent in, among native communities. I'm not saying that it doesn't happen in other communities, but it, it, unfortunately there is a high amount of cases that happens uh, in native communities. Um, I unfortunately, have seen uh, personal family members that I've grown up with um, fight through addiction and they're still fighting. And I've seen how like historical trauma and like just trauma overall can really have a huge and dangerous ripple effect on how they act in their behavior. And it is important to acknowledge this because these factors have a huge impact on children um, through like emotional, physical, and sexual abuse, homelessness, poverty, alcohol, alcoholism, and uh, and families. Uh, I know that these are some things that are kind of hard to put a stop to the cycle, I guess, in a way. And it is important to like acknowledge this, like what Shoshana said, uh, you don't know what you don't know. Um, but everyone, especially in Native communities is going through some sort of internal conflict or external conflict and it can really have a huge impact on the community. Uh, I remember um, during my time uh, at, in middle school, uh, there was a couple weeks where we had um, suicides. Uh, it just seemed like they uh, were nonstop almost. And it was really just hard to go through that and I, I just started noticing how like difficult it was just growing up and seeing finally, like, I guess through clear eyes now, like it wasn't normal. Like I considered that normal. And I guess now I am realizing that no, it's not normal. And it is important to acknowledge and be able to change that vicious cycle that keeps on happening and happening and it is overall very important to help future generations, like children now in order to make a positive impact on our native communities. Thank you for that, Hoshana. Keely, would you go next, please? I very much appreciated listening to the other panelists, especially, you know, about forgiving ourselves. Um, I think for me personally, um, with the COVID-19 pandemic and a lot of other people that I talked to, um, what was a really big thing was, you know, living in multi-generational households or households in which, you know, I have a lot of little siblings and COVID-19 was this very, is this very scary thing that we don't really know what the long-term effects are of it, but we do know it poses a danger to our most vulnerable populations. And so, you know, being at school, it was hard for me because it was, um, I was very disconnected. I didn't want to go home and put my family in harm's way because I was also at this institution in which um, they do not serve non-traditional students. And, um, 
really in person and um, threatened the public health of students and faculty alike. And so um, I just remember one day talking to my dad and he said, do you go to the grocery store? And I said, yes. And he said, well, being with your family is, you need that as much as you need food. And I realized that, you know, going through things like this, especially as a young person, when you don't know what the right decision is, or you don't know if you're making the right choice or not, that puts immense burden on people that are not equipped to, to make that choice. They don't know. And so, um, you know, I think just having that guidance um, would really help but also just understanding and, you know, forgiving ourselves for whatever decision we made in that moment and understanding that we did the best we could. Um, you know, that's what our communities have been doing all along, doing the best we can with the funding that we have been provided, with the services we have been provided. And so, um, you know, just taking that with us as we go into um, dealing with these um, trauma experiences and adapting them with COVID and all of these other things, but really understanding and telling our youth over and over again that like, you have to make the best decision for you in the moment and whatever decision that is, is right. So thank you. Thank you, Keely. Thank you to all the panelists. Thanks for sharing with all of us today. Teresa, I'll let you ask the next question. Yes, uh, thank you again, panelists. Uh, I think these are great answers and you're bringing a light to some very important topics and I appreciate every one of you. Um, so the next question is, what are some of the risk factors that you think greatly contribute or have led to the continuation of traumas in native communities? And I'm gonna start with Ashana. I think um, some risk factors more recently is COVID. Um, a lot has happened within Native communities because of COVID, especially with education. Um, I know where um, my public school, we had trouble um, getting hotspots and Chromebooks um, to youth. Um, and it was very hard for them to like, engage in school during um, the peak of COVID in the pandemic. And also during COVID, um, there is a lot of loss of elders. I know in my tribe, it was um, very hard hearing names off of like the newspaper, you would see the memorial for them. And it was very hard to acknowledge that because that for me means uh, another loss of like a vital piece of culture and our, our especially uh, the Kiowa language. I know most of them were like Kiowa speakers and I just know that we'll never uh, be able to get what they knew back. And overall, I think that the lack of resources in uh, native communities is like, a huge, also a huge um, factor when it comes to um, the continuation of trauma. And yeah. Thank you for that. You just brought up a very important topic. I'm gonna have to add, um, when you're having hot spots and bus drivers delivering uh, paperwork to students because they don't have internet infrastructure and internet access in the year 2022, for our Native peoples, it is troubling. So thank you for that answer. Um, I will now call on Keely. I think that, um, you know, our educational system is definitely a, a risk factor for Native youth. I think that other students, non-Native students that grow up in the educational system um, and never have the opportunity or are provided with the opportunity to learn about Native history and Native peoples or, you know, um, interact with Native peoples and the ignorance that is fostered in those spaces um, and that they take into their professions is a risk because 
um, then they cannot adequately serve native populations. And so um, I really think that addressing um, the honest history of this country um, is uh, one of the risk factors um, that has persisted as a result. And so um, also um, changes in food ways over time um, and um, that uh, that a lot of students face when um, going into higher education um, can be a very uh, high risk factor for um, maintaining student populations at like larger universities that maybe there are smaller um, native populations there. And so, um, yeah, just community building and having programs to support those transitions. Thank you, Keely. Another great answer. Uh, next, I will call on Grace. And as a reminder, panelists, if you need me to repeat the question, just let me know. Um, I think that while there are lots of risk factors, one that I can identify with is um, disconnect from my culture. Growing up, I was not connected to my culture very well. And um, I'm here today because I took the initiative to reach out um, to my family members who very gratefully helped me get in touch with who I am. And I think that had I not had that, I would still be dealing with issues such as mental health and um, other things such as that, that I would not have been able to um, relate to being Native American. And I think having that pride instilled in me has greatly helped who I am today. Thank you, Grace. And next I will call on Stevie. So um, kind of going off of what Hoshana said, um, I do agree that a lack of resources is one of the main reasons for a continuation of trauma because someone dealing with depression or suicidal thoughts um, you know, they might want the help, but they can't get it. And so it just, you know, they never get to deal with it um, and just help themselves. And I think uh, as I was listening to everybody talking, um, I think another reason is even if someone does have their resources, they might not want the help. Um, and that can cause continuation of traumas. Uh, I was thinking about myself. Um, you know, I fortunately had the resources to get counseling and, you know, to take medication to help with what I was going through. And I didn't always want to go to counseling or take my medicine. And so my mom, she, um, she helped push me <laughs> to get help and not everybody has a support system or a person like that to push them. Mm. Thank you, Stevie, uh, for that personal perspective. I appreciate that very much. And I have to add, I think it's very important what you just said out loud because a lot of other Native youth need to hear that. It's okay that we see a counselor and it's okay if we need to take medications if that's the route you wanna take. Um, let's stop that taboo is that it's not okay. Mental health is real, let's face it and let's get help when you need it. So Stevie, I appreciate that very much. Um, so the last person that I'm gonna call on um, is gonna be Shoshana. Well, Stevie, you almost got me all emotional over here. Um, so thank you for the words you had to say about mom and how instrumental she has been in helping you see things differently. Um, I was gonna go one direction with this, but then after hearing the other panelists talk about, you know, more specifically COVID, um, there is something I do wanna mention about that. I transferred to work for my tribe right in the thick of COVID and working for a health system, it was very chaotic. Um, and that's when I really got to understand the issues happening in my tribal community. 
because I was now a person of contact between our health system and our tribal members or our patients and just helping community members get through tough times, helping them get access to information or resources that they were too sick to find, just too tired to find and helping people just get help through this time. And it was really tough. I, I saw a lot of tribal members pass away. And, you know, I think even now we probably have around 500, which is a lot more than some surrounding tribes. The Sagan Box Nation has roughly 17 left. And I know COVID probably took out a lot of people. And you're right, it's a lot of loss in that. And I don't even think we've had time to really process that because we're, we're worried about ourselves too. We're worried about our kids and our grandparents. It's just no one has had the right time to grieve because we're still in this and it's been very overwhelming but I think with these programs coming out and helping families especially the families that have energy um what's what's that term I lost it multi-generational households you know I'm hoping that this program can help those families too because they're going through a lot I know they are and helping people break these stigmas of not wanting to get help. I, I can see some of that going away in my community a little bit. People are kind of being more open to wanting to get behavioral health services because of the heaviness that we have of people passing. And so that is one interesting thing I've noticed, but I also want to see more of a mental health and wellness toolkit for youth because this pandemic has really affected everybody. And I can't imagine still being in school while this happened. I know that the routine is really important for people and kids, even seeing my own sister get out of this, of her routine of school, you know, that can really mess people up sometimes. So I think more than ever, we need to work on having a toolkit for ourselves to help soothe ourselves in healthy ways to get through these tough times too. Thank you, Shoshona. I'm gonna to try not to get too emotional. Um, I agree with everything that the panelists said and I appreciate your openness and your honesty to everything. Absolutely agree. COVID has touched our, our native nations like nothing else and it's still going on and it's still here. Um, we haven't even had time to grieve. Um, so let me go ahead before I continue talking. Um, I'm going to go ahead and handle it over to Monica. But again, thank you so much, panelists. Okay, I got so busy listening to all of you. I forgot to unmute myself. Um, very, uh, I so appreciate all your uh, your comments and what you're sharing with us. Our next question is, what are some preventative and protective factors to overcome trauma? And do you have examples from your own community? And I will call on Hashona first. Um, so I was very blessed in the fact that I had um, help overcoming this vicious cycle um, from a young age. I was immersed in my culture. I had I had some idea where I was from. I knew how to dance. I knew some words in my language, and I had opportunities um, in high school to teach others about what it meant to me to be native. And I was also very lucky that I was able to attend a high school with some, like a lot of Native American youth. So I had a place where I could connect to a person next to me and we would have gone through the same similar experiences. Um, I also think that it is important to connect with 
your culture. Um, I know for me, Anna, Anadarko Public Schools had a dance troupe uh, called the Anadarko Dance Troupe, um, which allowed me to uh, go to schools across Oklahoma. Um, it was me, like K through 12, uh, Native American uh, dancers from like fancy shawl, southern uh, cloth, uh, buckskin, jingle dress, all these dances. And we teach those who did not know about like what it, what dances these were. And that opportunity, it was just very, I was very fortunate that I had that because it always allowed myself to be, feel connected. And it, that was very vital. And I've been able to have an active community in which we um, had health fairs and put on by the, the tribes surrounding us or uh, like the Indian hospital. And I would attend those with my mom. She would always make me go pass out surveys for her, you know, uh, for like her, she was a director of the childcare and I would help her out and inform others during these health fairs. And I also like been a part of, uh, thankfully a part of like the National Indian Education Association, um, their native language listening sessions. I've been able to present those. And uh, I've been also able to travel along with my tribe, uh, the Kiowa Teen Suicide Prevention Program and our higher education program to DC and which we learned about the political aspects of like uh, tribal sovereignty. And, and more recently, I've been uh, more in tune with my own language. I am currently hoping to be credentialed by the end of May. I am a teacher candidate for the Kiowa Tribe Language and Cultural Revitalization Program. And I hope to be credentialed to teach uh, the Kiowa language to younger generations and uh, hopefully have a positive impact on future generations. And I think most importantly for me, um, I think the very like on top of all that is my family. I was, I'm the oldest of four siblings or I'm the oldest of five kids. Um, so I'm usually the mom um, I helped raise my four younger siblings, and I taught my younger sisters how to braid their hair, how to dance southern cloth, and, like, how to even put on the regalia correctly when we went to powwows, and so I think, for me, I think connecting to my culture and, and just having a nice support, support system um, helped me overcome um, this vicious cycle that often happens in Native American communities. Thank you, Hoshona. It sounds like you've been very, very busy participating in all those activities. So let's hear from uh, Shoshana. Okay. So for me, um, when, when thinking about protective and preventative factors, I um, have a lot of examples. However, I think to me right now, the most important one is that my mom really helped me, um, I guess, go down a, a path that I never expected myself to go down. And it was because I met a lot of people who had pasts that maybe they weren't proud of, but they were doing something good with their lives now. They learned their lessons, they wanted to help others in more of like a rehabilitative way with prevention and using culture as prevention methods to connect with Native youth in their community. So being around that environment, being around ladies that were passionate about working in their communities, I learned so much from them. And it really pushed me, pushed myself to learn more because I was slowly learning more about myself, how I saw the world, how I saw my family and other tribes that I've been working with throughout the state of Oklahoma. And um, 
So even right now, like I, I do want to give thanks to those ladies. And one of them, her name was Clara Bushyhead, and she was Cheyenne Arapaho from Clinton, Oklahoma, which is like Western Oklahoma. And I definitely learned a lot from her. She pushed for prevention and she pushed for protective factors to be implement, implemented more into her community so much to the point that even after the grant program ended, the tribe um, made a line item in their budget for, for the prevention program, traditional addiction. And that's a really big deal. That's a really big accomplishment as far as achieving sustainability. I think SAMHSA was very happy to see that too, some sort of sustainability in a program. And just getting to watch that happen was very inspiring. And unfortunately, she passed away recently. So there's a lot of knowledge she had that, you know, I don't know if she was able to pass that on to other people, but it's up to that community now to keep pushing forward because I know that she would want that. And so I would say having support, having support around me was a great protective factor. And I've only ever wanted to provide that to other people as well. I became involved with the National Council of Urban Indian Health. They had a youth council for urban natives. And I was a part of that in, inaugural um, first round. And we really, from the ground up, built a youth council, built the framework, roles and responsibilities, what topics we wanted to focus on. And I learned so much through that experience, especially the peer-to-peer -peer support. It's not a lot. Uh, I haven't had a lot of opportunities in the area that I live to work with other natives, other native youth, I mean. But through opportunities like this, through webinars, through online initiatives, I've been able to meet a lot of other Native youth doing great things in their communities. And I think if we can just all share, you know, the great protective factors that we've experienced, it could inspire other communities to implement the same things too. Thank you so much. Uh, so let's go to Keely. I really agree with um, what all the other panelists have said and like support um, because my greatest preventative and protective factor has always been my family. So like I said before, you know, when COVID started and I realized, you know, what I needed and prioritized that and went home. And even though I knew it would be harder doing schooling online in a house with, you know, six other siblings also on the internet and the bandwidth, um, you know, just, I think a big preventative factor is just knowing what you need in a moment and going for it, even if you know it's not comfortable or it's not easy. Um, and so, also in my family, we really try to focus on you know growing food foods in our garden and um, eating healthy and getting out together on walks or exercising, spending time with one another, um, like playing games, things like that. Um, that I have really appreciated and that has really impacted my life in a positive way. Um, now that I am back at school though, um, I am participating in a language program. So I was able to learn Ms. Vaki at the settlement school growing up. But um, now that I'm you know, graduated, I can take a language program over Zoom. And so being away from home, but still being able to have access um, to language programs has um, really helped me to, you know, still have that connection. And then in our in our community also, um, we have um, the Red Earth Gardens. So um, I think that's a really amazing community uh, based uh, this um, that has like helped us to, you know, learn more about um, some healthy food ways and stuff. So thank you for sharing that. Keely. Uh, let's go to Stevie. So yeah, I wanted to kind of repeat what my sister said about culture as prevention, because um, I've, as I've grown up and as I'm still growing up, uh, I noticed that that is key into breaking the cycle, as everyone's saying. 
Um, for example, at my school, we have Native American club. And I can think of a few of my classmates who have had very traumatic experiences um, in the past year. And with our club, uh, we've, have, we've had opportunities to go to the first Americans Museum and get involved with different projects around the school and for our club. And for those kids, it's an outlet for them to be with their own people and be with like-minded people and have a distraction from everything that's going on. Um, another example I can think of is um, so I have a cousin and she, <laughs> I guess you could say she got into some trouble and just whatever else. And I remember I was princess at the time and she became the, she also became a princess and I, it like completely turned her around because um, she was getting involved with the powwows, the people the veterans and just helping out. And it really got her away from whatever path she was about to go down. Thanks for sharing, Stevie. So we will go to Grace. I um, love what all the panelists have said. I think these are all great tools. For me, um, the preventative and protective factors so my dad always told me, and a lot of family members have told me to find people, places, and things that feel like home. So my dad has always felt like home to me. I can come to him with any problem and he will support me, love me, open arms. And that feeling has always made me feel supported. Um, I think that something that I do that makes me feel like home is cooking. I think being in the kitchen with my family makes me feel connected to the people that I love. And I think that makes me feel very good and supported and being outside is a place that I feel um, makes me feel like home and I think remembering that you can have home in a lot of different ways can help you as well and I also think that putting myself into situations such as these can really help me as well. Thank you so much I made a few notes here while you were talking so I can remember to do those things myself <laughs> eating healthy going out spending time with family it's all good. Thank you so much for all your comments. And I will hand it over to Teresa. Thank you again, panelists. And yes, I'm making notes myself, Monica. Um, so we have one more question for you ladies before we open it up to the audience. Um, this is something that is really dear to me because I, I believe that something has to change within ourselves to make us successful. And obviously you ladies are on the right path. So what, personal experience or opportunities have you encountered that helped you get to where you are today? And I'm going to open it up to Stevie. So I would say um, what helped me get here today is whenever I was 11, um, I applied to be a trainer for the Community Anti-Drug Coalitions of America. And I remember at that time, the minimum age requirement was 13 because it went from 13 to 17. And I didn't think I was going to get picked at all, that they would even care about me. But I did it anyways, and it ended up selecting me. And so I went through a rigorous process of learning about prevention um, so I can be qualified enough to talk to other youth about prevention. And from there, I was able to get involved with different campaigns and meet with the Surgeon General and get involved with a lot of projects like this to um, get my word out. And I was the Junior Miss Princess for a while uh, for the Second Foxes and that helped give me a platform mm -hmm. to get my voice out even more. Thank you, Stevie. And next I will go to Grace. Um, I think that, so I want to say everything that I am today is because of my dad. My dad has been the biggest supporter in my life. Um, my dad didn't go to college, but he saw more for me than he had. And he always supported me to do 
anything that I wanted. I could tell him that I wanted to go to Mars and he would find a way to get me there. So I think that seeing that support is where I am today. Thank you, Grace. Hashona. Um, I, I especially want to thank my mother for where I am today. I don't think I would have gotten to where I am right now if it wasn't for her. Um, my dad too, even though he's a bit stubborn sometimes, but it's that tough love. Um, I think overall, like what made me here, like become what I am, I guess is, I don't know, I was very stubborn growing up. Like I grew up and I was like, I want to be top of the class because I don't see any Native Americans that are top of their class like where I was. And I was like, okay, I'm going to do that. And that was my goal. And I just wanted, like right now, I just want to become a role model that I, that younger me would have wanted to become, like, like would look up to. And I just want to make an impact um, on my siblings. So they're still growing up and I want to let them know that um, Native Americans aren't dead. Uh, we're not a dead part of history and we're very much alive, uh, resilient, thriving, surviving in our own cultures and communities. And I think it's very important to have more representation of that uh, like overall, like whether that be in education, uh, politics, um, other things. I think it's very important to have the younger generation have people that go through similar experiences in like high positions. And I just keep that in mind, like whenever I plan to do something. And I think it's very important to leave, leave a positive impact on the world and make it a better place than when you first saw it. Thank you so much for your answer. Uh, and I'm gonna call on Keely. Like the other panelists, I also, you know, owe it to both my parents for who I am today. Um, they do so much for me and support me. And so, like, I'm so grateful to them. But also my experience moving around a lot, um, seeing a lot of different perspectives um, kind of helped me realize um, that it's okay to be uncomfortable. So when I got to high school, I would seek out all these opportunities, um, you know, trying out for public public speaking or speech contests, trying to do things that maybe weren't the most comfortable at the time, but pushing through that really helps me to be where I am now um, and do things like this even um, and overcome like, yeah, overcome that discomfort. Um, also just so many amazing mentors that have helped me throughout the years and given me advice when I needed it. And, you know, all my siblings, of course, and my friends, really just that support network that I think everybody needs, so. Thank you, Keeling. And lastly, Shoshona, close it out for us. All right, well, some of my personal experiences and opportunities that I encountered that helped me get to where I am today. You know, I, I can't take full credit for any of it unless I mention my mom and even my sister. You know, my mom, I, I really think she was worried about me. She hasn't really said it to me, but <laughs> I think she was worried about me looking back. And I think exposing me to prevention programs you know, it was really a lifesaver because I, I needed that. And I'm really grateful to learn about all the culture as prevention methods and all the different ways that can help with trauma and healing our communities, healing ourselves. That's what I've really spent the last few years of my life doing is, you know, I, I, I kind of marked off all the things I wanted to do I graduated, which was a really big thing for me because I, like I said, I was not good in school. I, I've never been good in school. The way they teach, that's just not how I learned. So I struggled a lot. 
but I still managed to graduate college and work on my career. But at one point, I was like, you know, I still feel miserable. I achieved A, B, and C, but I still feel the same as I always have. I don't feel any better. What is going on with me? So I took a step back from my education. I wanted to go for my um, master's degree, but I there was just something in me that knew I needed to work on myself right now. In the past couple of years, going back to my tribe, getting reacquainted with tribal members, even family members that I lost contact with and telling me stories about family that I haven't seen in years. You know, it has filled up this emptiness in me that I didn't realize I was missing. And to me, that's the greatest experience I've had so far. Of all the ups and downs I've had, it led me back home. It led me back to my tribe. It led me back to feeling connected because I was scared that I was gone for so long that people wouldn't know me anymore. People wouldn't recognize me. I wouldn't be accepted, but I was through the help of other people in my tribe because they believed in me. And so just like my mom and my sister, my mom has helped push me to keep moving forward. And my sister, you know, she, we are almost a decade apart. So we grew up very differently, very, very, very differently. And I had a lot of pressure when I was getting older, like, oh God, she's, when is she gonna start recognizing the things I'm doing? I got scared because I knew I wasn't doing the right things. And at one point I was just like, you know, I need to be a better example for her. I need to be more real with her. I need to show her that you don't have to act like everything's perfect. You can come to me whenever there's problems because I wish there was someone like me at her age. And so in a way, our relationship has gotten better because I'm healing myself. I'm almost healing my inner child and helping my sister at the same time. And so it's a really great full circle moment and I'm really happy that I get to do, um, talk about prevention and resiliency and historical trauma with my family. Me, my mom and my sister, we've done a few um, trainings together and those are always the best because it's just like, wow, like look where we're at and look from where we came from and now look where we are and we're together and we're doing this together. It's, I just still can't believe we're at this point now. So I'm really happy to share that with you all. Thank you. Thank you, Shoshona. Thank you, panelists. Um, once again, I think we, you guys have done an awesome job. Um, I am going to open it up to the audience. We do still have a lot of people on the call. So if you could either put your questions in the chat um, or um, raise your hand, Monica and I will um, look around and um, call on you. So any questions you have for the panelists? And why we're waiting on that, I just, every time I do this, I get inspired. Um, I personally love hearing from our Native youth. Um, I'm glad that you guys are here today. Um, you don't know what you're doing. You being here for an hour and a half may have inspired another Native youth to follow suit. Um, because it only takes one person, one person to inspire you to do better and to get yourself on the right path. So I thank you very much. So any questions in the audience? Okay, so we have one question here okay. from Pedro, and he is asking, as young people, what do you think is an appropriate way to introduce younger kids about trauma? And I'm going to open that up to anybody that wants to step up and answer, and if you need to repeat the question, just let us know. Oh, I'll take a stab at it. So a couple of years ago, I worked on a suicide prevention program. And at the time, a lot of other tribes were getting the same grant. And some of us ran into this unique issue of, okay, 
this is a very heavy topic, suicide prevention. There's a lot of tribes that are not comfortable with even the word suicide. Some programs had to completely revamp their wording because of the community this grant was going to be in. It just was not acceptable. It would almost be disrespectful to be so brash about it. And so I would definitely suggest um, having advisory councils, having even a teacher, not a teacher, a parent, some sort of parent um, council to let them get involved in this to build trust, especially when these are hard topics that tribes haven't really addressed a lot in their communities. It's so important to get them included in it, have town hall meetings, have start different councils, gather data and information to understand their perspective on these certain topics. And there's different um, channels of communication you can use to really ease into topics of trauma. And I think that, I believe it's called, it's a, it's a life skills, healthy life skills training, but it's for native youth. I think I forgot what it's called. Um, if someone remembers what it's called, please tell me because I can't remember. But that, that program, schools implement it and it talks a little bit about coping, healthy coping skills. And it's on different levels from middle school all the way down to I think even third or fourth grade. You know, they just word things differently. And I think that would be a great opportunity to use as well. Yeah, I think life skills, life skills for Native Americans. It's, it's called something like that. I'll have to look at it. Thank you, Shoshona. Any other Go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm not a panelist, but I do have a comment. Is mm -hmm. that okay? Absolutely. My name is, my name is Trivia, afraid of lightning, Craddock. Um, I am from uh, the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe, um, and I'm a program manager for a suicide intervention prevention program here in Rapid City, South Dakota. And um, uh, I have probably about 20 years of experience with um, uh, historical trauma and generational trauma. And uh, I work for the um, tribal chairman's, uh, the, tri the Great Plains Tribal Leaders Health Board in South Dakota. And what we're using to introduce um, therapeutic ways for um, our youth is we're really going back to our cultural foundation. We, um, one of the things that we do that is very, very important to us is the healing um, process with the kids along with family. Um, understanding the Lakota language and understanding who you are as a Lakota girl or a Lakota boy. Um, a lot of our families um, are also experience those um, adverse childhood experiences. So when we work with our kids with suicidal ideation, we can work with them and work with them and work, work with them and um, put our culture and, and speak our language and sing those songs and do inipi and have um, ceremonies for our young youngsters. But when they go back home, they're dealing with a mom, a dad, an uncle, um, a grandma, a grandpa who's had those adverse childhood experiences. So we, our community has extended the healing process out to the adults as well as the children. So it's more of a, um, a full circle um, type of healing. So when we work with the kids on um, the uh, adverse childhood experiences, we go with what uh, Western science says we use, we use some of that, but we also use our culture as a foundation for healing. We really use those um, healing songs and we teach our youth the words of what those songs mean so that they're able to heal from the inside out with their culture and with um, evidence-based practices as well. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else want to speak and ask a question or should we go ahead and go to the questions in the chat? I'd like to ask a question if I could. I'm Absolutely. trying to write it out, but I, it doesn't make sense when I write it. <laughs> um, I'm Chief Mitchum from South Carolina. And what I wanted to find out from the panelists, two questions. Uh, which do you think is the source of more trauma among youth in the school setting, the mm. teachers or the students? Mm. Great question. And then the, the follow-up was, does the trauma start from the aspect of Native American history or peers being uneducated about Native Americans? 
and and I can explain that. Um, my children, uh, they, I have my own experience, but my children's experiences uh, as their parent, what I saw was the teachers knew more about Indians than me, and I'm the chief of a tribe. Um, and there, you know, they would come, the school bus come pick the kids up for school, and they drive up with the kids war hooping at the kids. So which was the worst, the teachers or the kids? Would any of our panelists like to answer that? Okay, I try not to say anything, but I have to answer this question. Mm -hmm. I'm a high school dropout. I'm a high school dropout because my native, excuse me, my coach said to me, I do not want your kind of my team. He killed me. I let that man destroy me. I walked out of school. I went to drugs. I went to no good. Um, it was a white, prominent, rich school. Um, it was not until years later, till one person came into my life and said, Teresa, you're not happy. What do you need to make your life better? And I said, if I could do it over again, I'd go to college. And I did. And I went to a Native American college and it changed my life. I, like Shoshona, would not talk, was very shy, went with the status quo. If you told me to do something, I would do it. I would not look at you. I did not have a voice, did not have any self-worth. I let that coach destroy who I am. Um, so for me, as teachers, whether you're Native or non-Native, it is imperative that you do less harm than good. And you really need to be honest with yourself if you're working with our Native youth, that you are there for the right reasons. And you're not there to change us. You're not there to make us who you are or who you want to be. You are there to make us, to, to meet us where we are so that we grow up to be who we are meant to be in this life. And I'm sorry that I had to chime in on that, but you just brought up something very passionate, um, Chief Michelle. So I had to share that with you. And I, I appreciate that. And I, I appreciate that nobody responded because it's an emotional question. I don't think anybody can answer that question without going to tears because I'm, I'm watching you and I, I can see that you don't want to answer it because you don't want to break out the Kleenex. Um, and I appreciate that. You're, I have a lot of respect for every one of you that have, have joined this panel. Uh, presenting and uh, listening to you. I've heard all of you speak very highly of your parents as your advocates. Um, so I think that um, if the only thing I could add, take those two questions back to your table and, and hone in on them because that's, that is a question that a lot of parents have asked and a lot of kids are asking. Thank you for that. Panelists, do you want to add to that at all before we go on? And I know Nicholas has got his hand raised. <laughs> go ahead, Nicholas. No, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity, but also really thank you for the panelists to be able to step forward and speak about this from your own experience. It reminds me even of my own. And also it's just, I think a question that I even struggle with is how do we also do this for indigenous young boys and men? because they are suffering as well, but also we are taught through socialization and Western society that we're supposed to suppress our feelings and never speak about these things, that we're supposed to just buck up and accept the reality of this trauma and this treatment that we receive. And I speak about that only because I have been in communication with a group of indigenous young men through a project that I did here in Arizona called Engaging Native Boys, where we actually asked them about some of their own traumas and things that they have gone through. And as a result, we've developed this ongoing kinship where we, we meet monthly to again, talk about this ongoing things that are happening in our lives. But I think about the ways in which Again, how I dealt with the trauma, so very much like the panelists, I too am a survivor of physical, emotional, psychological abuse, and it, take, it took me many, many years to cope with that. Um, I fortunately turned to education to survive that, meaning I would just go and do my homework and study, and that has led me to where I am today, which is a fourth-year PhD student in higher education. But it's a weird space to be in to now understand the historical 
global sociological factors that go into our reality and understanding the trauma that I experienced was the result of colonization, boarding school experience, all of these larger factors that are beyond our communities. And how do we begin to bring this conversation to the forefront and say that it's the dominant culture's way of viewing us, seeing us, talking about us, interacting with us. All of those things are these forms of trauma that impact the way our children see themselves, hope for themselves, and their possibilities for their future. So again, I just really wanted to just take a moment and just say thank you for all of this. But I also think about how I have a group of young men that I'm sure are willing to also come forward and speak about this as well, because again, we recognize that our experience with it is very different. Mm -hmm. But I also speak about it coming from a two spirit background to say even that and something I bring up in the conversation is knowing that my identity is very different than what we see in the dominant culture, and also knowing the history of what is being spoken about in the literature as gender side. The idea that our communities had gender systems that extended beyond the binary Western system and that much of people that I would look to for guidance have been killed off, eliminated, are still being threatened in everyday society today. So how do we go back not only to the tradition and culture, but how do we, as I use in my teaching to my students, how do we remember ourselves, meaning how do we bring those individuals back into the circle of our communities, because their identities are unique and also important for our communities and why they also had unique positions for ceremonies within our communities. But as a result of colonization, we no longer recognize them, see them, and we have excluded them from our communities. So how do we again, remember all of our people, who they are, their identities, but also see ourselves through our own understanding. Because again, for my research, what I've come to find is that within the Navajo culture, there is a five gender sexuality system that has always existed, but because of colonization that has quickly been erased in about 150 years. The nice thing about my research is that I've also come to find that there is a Western researcher who studies intersex children who came to the same conclusion that there should be a five gender system. So what does that mean now that West, my culture, my people have had their gender and sexuality system validated by a Western scientist? So these are just things that I normally speak about in other places. But again, just stuff that we need to bring to the forefront is that not only does culture, but the knowledge systems that we have, have so much more to offer us that what does it mean to now step into that full understanding? Understanding and remember the things that we used to know about ourselves and how that has changed and can help our students see themselves for who they are. They're created exactly the way they're supposed to be created. They express themselves the way they're supposed to express themselves. And there's nothing wrong with them. The only reason we see there's something wrong is because we see them through a Western binary system that immediately erases or actually sees them as just even the fact that they're native, that there's something wrong with them. So just wanted to step back and again, say thank you, but also again, really would love to start to see some conversations that include indigenous young boys and men, but I know also that's a challenge because we struggle with being comfortable speaking about these in public spaces. So thank you. Thank you, Nicholas. Would any of our panelists like to comment about any of that he just said? Keely? because I know that you've talked about this some, um, about Western society, how they have shaped what they want us to be. Do you want to speak on that? And I don't want to put you on the bus, so if you don't want to, that's fine. And any of our other panelists that want to say anything, that'd be great. Um, my name is Sia Cooney, and I'm uh, from Alaska, from Fairbanks, Alaska. Yes. Um, I'm Athabascan and uh, Lakota. Um, I work with, on a grant that's OJJDP, and it's the Juvenile Justice Department System at a school that is like a charter school, I guess you would say. And what my, um, I won't cry because I've been going through a lot, but I probably will. Um, my kids are my heart. Um, my son is my heart. Um, and it bugs me that I wish I could hear more stories like you young ladies that have spoken because 
since I was a kid, this has been a transition and it's been hard. And all I've heard about is all this movement to do this, all this money to do this, but um, our youth aren't comfortable talking to non-Native people. And I wish people would understand that. Um, and I wish they would know that they don't want to be labeled because they've already been labeled part of the system, whether it be OCS, whether it be they have no parents, whether it be they have alcohol and drugs or their dad is in jail. Um, they all have all these stigmatisms. I never grew up with this as a youth because um, my mom blessed me with letting me stay with my aunt and my uncle. And out of all the 24 grandkids that my grandmother had, there was probably only about five of us that could say that we had a chance. So um, hearing you young ladies talk gives me hope because yesterday I felt hopeless because it's a cycle. And when COVID hits, it just made that cycle even harder. I'm grieving through loss and whether it be your own loss or the kids' loss and they don't know how to handle it really just um, makes you feel kind of empty. So um, I'd like to say that thank you young ladies for sharing because it gives me hope and encouragement to keep doing my work. <laughs> thank you for that. Thank you for sharing. <clears throat> Any my panelists want to say anything? I think someone else had their hand up. We did go ahead and, and uh, ask if you'd like to. All right, great. Um, I, I just have a comment that I want to make. I don't have a question. Uh, my first comment is um, I, I appreciate the shout out to Nor Nor Norman North High School because that's where I went to school. So go T Wolves. Um, the second thing I want to say is um, I, I just want to say thank you to the pan the panelists for, for being willing to do this. We as in as Indigenous people are so lucky and blessed today to have you come share your experiences and your voice. I just want to say how grateful it how, how grateful I am for that and how wonderful of a job you guys did. So thank you. Thank you, Cliff. Anybody else? Uh, someone asked, has the issues of school mascots made the experience of trauma worse? Who would like to answer that? Keely? Um, yeah, I know. Um, a lot of people have different views on this. Um, I would say it's different for every individual, but it is, I think it plays a lot into the cultural stress that Native youth have to deal with when going into non-Native spaces. Um, I personally have dealt with this a lot, especially here at this university. Um, I um, am, uh, with the Native American Student Association and we'll do different events, tabling, and people will come up to us and really try to instigate or suggest things and say like, well, how can you be mad at that when, you know, there's this or how is that valid? But, um, you know, there is statistical evidence that school mascots do affect the psyche of Native youth. Um, and I uh, just don't really believe that any tribal nation or any individual should ever be able to speak on behalf of a whole generalized population. So that's my view on it uh, personally. But, um, you know, I really just hope that um, with, you know, better education, um, teaching truthful history, people can really begin to see how um, strange it is and why why is it if it were any group other group of people this wouldn't be okay but with you know our populations it is and you know native youth they do realize that younger than you probably think and they they might not even realize that they realize that but they 
have those associations and just getting to that point where you're like, do you truly start to understand it? I've had different classes that talk about it. Um, it, it is really um, troubling just knowing like, wow, I've been seeing this on the TV for years or I have know people who support this team and like they don't really think about that when they, they choose to do those things. So just uh, trying to navigate the ignorance can really uh, just be another burden of stress on top of other trauma um, experiences. Absolutely. We have about 10 more minutes. Um, anybody else like to say anything or have any other questions for the panelists? Okay, so Marla does have a question. And she said, she apologizes, she knows, knows this is a little off topic, um, but she didn't want to ask. Um, do you see more underage drinking or substance abuse during the pandemic? And how would you help this person out uh, being that you may have been going through some trauma? Kitty, you wanna go ahead and answer that? Yeah, I can if uh, none of the old panelists wanted to respond. Um, I do think that there is higher rates of substance abuse given the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, just because there's less for young people to do. So uh, tuning into different activities, like I went home with my family and we would always go on hikes or we would you know, drive somewhere beautiful and spend time together. So for me, that was like a, a protective factor. And, um, you know, the Meskwaki Nation is building a center. And so that is another way that we are, you know, really trying to provide um, in our community spaces for um, youth to do uh, things that aren't, you know, engaging with those kind of harmful substances, um, reaching out to youth, being a mentor to them, asking, you know, what are your short-term and long-term goals? Um, because I think with COVID, everyone has been kind of experiencing this weird warp in time where, you know, a week goes by so quickly, or it could feel like a year. And for people who are struggling with substance abuse, that is that is a, a huge risk factor. So really having a sense of time, a sense of schedule, um, and having the support um, you know, reaching out to people that you haven't talked to in forever and just saying, hey, how are you? Are you doing okay? You know, even just messaging online, someone can feel more connected and less isolated and that could um, really prevent them from, you know, going that way, so. Thank you, Keely. Would any of the other panelists like to add to that? Stevie? Yeah, yeah I can add to that. Um, so yeah, I do agree that the pandemic has increased um, substance abuse use. Um, I have an acquaintance. She started getting involved with some of that, especially during the pandemic. And we just really grew apart. And I tried my best to um, just try to check up on her. And I'll say like, well, how are you doing with trying to quit? And it got to the point where I realized I, I can't make her quit. Sometimes you can't save somebody who doesn't want to be saved or helped. And it was really, really hard to accept that. But that doesn't mean that I should just totally give up on her. Um, I still talk to her sometimes and just, a, I think just a checkup every now and then, um, like Keely said, so that they don't feel as isolated. Thank you, Stevie. Grace, did you want to answer? I couldn't tell if I saw your hand up or not. Oh, no, not that question, but there was one in the chat that we can get to in a minute. Okay, you want to go ahead and what's the question? The, um, the question was if there was any um, podcasts or indigenous mm -hmm. motivators that help us. Um, and I want to say my friend, um, Rosalie Fish, she is a Native American um runner she used to run at Iowa Central 
and now she's at Washington, I believe, and she runs for um, Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women, and she is a huge um, supporter and advocate, and her page has a lot of good, helpful tips. Thank you, Grace. Any of our other panelists want to answer that? Um, also, I'm reading that. I don't have a link, but her name is Rosalie Fish. Um, I can put her name in the chat too. I can type it out. But she has um, an Instagram page and she is just very, I find her very helpful as well. I'll put her name in the chat right now. Thank you. I know we didn't get to everybody's questions. Um, I apologize, but we have run out of time. Uh, these panelists are in school. They work, they have lives, they have um, other things and priorities that they do need to get to. So I do want to, um, let's go ahead and end it for today. Um, I wanna say again, uh, thank you panelists for opening up your hearts um, and just uh, being here today being honest, um, and, and I think this is, for me, it, it's just another way to help our Native people to heal. So from the bottom of my heart, I thank each and every one of you that was here today. Miigwech, you're getting a lot of thank yous in the comments. You guys are wonderful. Thanks to everyone who came today. Please be on the outlook for future events from our centers. Yes. Thank you guys. Have a wonderful Thursday. Panelists, go do your homework. <laughs> Thank you. See you. Bye.